an incendiary used by the military, thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. Charlie Vichers was a supervisor of removal operations at Ground Zero. From PBS's America Rebuilds page, we read, Vichers' crew picked up 40 to 60 foot long pieces of steel impaled in the pile, where the bottom 20 feet would be glowing red hot. Vichers said, trucks loaded with steel would pass by and you could feel the back of your neck burning standing 20 feet away. In an article called A Dangerous Worksite, the U.S. Department of Labor wrote, underground fires burned at temperatures of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. This was confirmed by Mayor Giuliani. There were fires of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit below the ground. The Journal of the American Society of Safety Engineers wrote, thermal measurements taken by helicopter each day showed underground temperatures ranging from 400 to more than 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. You must have had a much hotter heat source for you to get 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, second law of thermodynamics says, just like water can only flow downhill when it's poured on the ground, similarly, heat can only move downhill. But with heat, downhill means from a region of higher temperature to a region of lower temperature. And the heat flowing uphill from a 750 degree flame to a 3,000 degree puddle of molten steel violated the second law of thermodynamics. You cannot get a flame hot enough to start the metal to molten, make it molten in the first place so that this other process takes off. I don't know of any mechanism for that. The only way that's known that a carbonaceous material can cause steel or iron oxide to, to be, turn into a molten metal is in a blast furnace. Yeah, and that's very different than what we had. In the dust, we found what we characterize as unreacted thermitic material in the shape of some very tiny red-gray chips, which have different properties. Most importantly is they're still reacting, some of them, and uh, in the reaction they produce molten iron, which is the prime indication of a thermitic reaction and such a reaction can be used to destroy steel structures. What we have found is a modern version of thermite, which we call nanothermite, which is produced in a different way. It is not just two powders being mixed. The material is actually built from the atom scale up. We call it the bottom up procedure which is what you do in nanotechnology. The ingredients are much smaller, which means they're reacting faster and they are more easily ignited. The primary elements in the red material are aluminum, iron oxide, as well as silicon and carbon. The iron oxide appears in fasted grains, approximately 100 nanometers across, the aluminum appears in thin platelets about 40 nanometers thick. It is the small size of the uh, particles involved in this material that allow us to characterize it as nanothermite. In ordinary thermite, the uh, particle size is much larger, and hence ordinary thermite is an incendiary, whereas as the particle size becomes smaller and smaller, superthermite is sometimes called. One of the things I'd like to stress about these chips is that they uh, really shouldn't be there. They're not uh, a natural formed um, agglomeration of aluminum from the aircraft or materials that were in the building and iron oxide that got knocked off. It isn't just a haphazard bringing together of iron oxide and aluminum, which is the basic components of thermite. This is a material that um, is made up of nano-sized particles that are all very uniform, very symmetrical. This cannot be paint. Paint does not have these exotic properties. It's impossible. There was actually some significant findings in the residue. After igniting these chips in the DSC, we found uh, microspheres. 
The significance of the, of the calorimeter cannot be uh, understated here. Many of these spheres had the exact or identical composition or very similar composition as the spheres that Steve was finding in the dust samples. They were also very similar to spheres found in thermite, in commercial thermite. There were no microspheres found in, in the paint sample that had been ignited in the DSC. Um, we also took paint that came off of the WTC steel and looked at that in the SEM and, and did a compositional analysis of that and found that it was not similar to the red gray chip or the red layer of the red gray chips. So it wasn't, the red gray chips are not the primer paint that was used on the WTC steel. This is material that is, uh, is of military use that really shouldn't be there. An incendiary used by the military? Thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. We know that open air fires cannot burn hot enough to melt steel, but metal had melted at the base of the towers. In one piece, um, I found a pore in the steel that, w that had pure sulfur uh, embedded in the pore. Uh, which I thought was very strange, and um, so that's when I, I really started looking for sulfur in, in, and, and finding it in more abundance in some, of these in some of these phases. There's a government theory that calcium, calcium sulfate from gypsum boards was the source of sulfur, and that's wrong. Uh, calcium sulfate cannot go undergo any kind of a chemical reaction that produces the element sulfur, and we're not dealing with any kind of uh, compound of sulfur. When we're talking about sulfidation, we're dealt, dealing with uh, the element sulfur. How do you get the sulfur um, in these uh, pieces of steel or, or in the debris? And, um, and that question is, is unanswered. There's a version of thermite called thermate, which has uh, sulfur in the thermate. And what the sulfur does is it, it uh, it's sort of like um, salt on ice. And it just basically makes the uh, steel melt at a lower temperature. And if you do a search on Google for uh, thermite and building demolition, you can find devices that have been fabricated uh, and invented that use thermite for building demolitions. An incendiary is something which can be used to destroy something by the means of heat, while an explosive is something which reacts, acts with pressure. It knocks things apart. In the case of thermite cutting charges, you would have heard far less noise since they are worked by uh, thermal heating, melting of the steel, rather than an explosive cutting as in RDX charges. Older flights had detected uh, with infrared camera 1400 degree Fahrenheit hotspots on the surface uh, of ground zero. And uh, that being there for a week, um, you know, indicates that there was something very hot going on below the surface. So thermite, if it was uh, present at the World Trade Center and created this molten metal that uh, so many witnesses and uh, photographic evidence shows, would also explain potentially the fact that the fires could not be put out at ground zero. The fires lasted for quite a while, but um, most importantly, they were um, deep within the pile where people would expect that it, the environment was oxygen starved. And uh, thermite could explain this because it has its own oxidant within. It's actually the uh, metallic oxide that provides the oxidant to allow the uh, incendiary thermite reaction to occur, even underwater. Possibly the most important unexplained phenomenon at ground zero are the extremely high temperatures registered under the rubble for many weeks after the collapses. On September 16, NASA shot these thermographic images of ground zero, indicating unusually high temperatures at the base of the three collapsed buildings. Despite the heavy rains of September 14th, the hotspots registered peak temperatures of more than 1300 degrees under the rubble, 
Ten days later, the fires kept burning. What's to explain, Governor, the smoke that still comes out There's of the still, fire? There's still fire down below. There is such an incredibly deep pile of rubble, and the, the tower goes down by six stories underground. But we had uh, ABC uh, crews come back just in the last few minutes and telling us there are still flames coming out of the base of the trade towers. For the rescue workers, this became an additional burden on their already gruesome task. Out still on the rubble, it's still, uh, I believe, 1,100 degrees. The guy's boots just melt within a few hours. On October 8th, the hot spots under the three collapsed buildings remained clearly visible. Six weeks later, as the excavations progressed, the situation seemed only to get worse. Oh, it's unbelievable. And this is six weeks later, almost six weeks later. And as we get closer to the center of this, it gets hotter and hotter. It's probably 1,500 degrees. We've had some small windows into um, what we thought was a core at some point, and it looked like a, uh, an oven. You know, it was just roaring inside. And it was just a bright, bright reddish-orange color. The consequences of such extreme temperatures were quite visible on the steel that was being extracted from the rubble. Where the grapplers were, were pulling stuff out, uh, big sections of iron that were literally on fire on the other end. They would hit the air and burst into flames, which was uh, pretty spooky to see. You would create an air pocket by moving steel, fueling the fires on the ground. But you know, these underground fires were just uh, like the fires of hell. If you could make a video of what you perceive hell to look like from fire shooting up at times, that's what would happen. You would be in the middle of what would look like steel, and then fire just would pop up. Firemen were coming out with an iron worker with their boots literally melted, and then the hose would come over and they would try to put that part out. I got there. Charlie Vitchers was a supervisor of removal operations at Ground Zero. From PBS's America Rebuilds page, we read, Vitcher's crew picked up 40 to 60 foot long pieces of steel impaled in the pile, where the bottom 20 feet would be glowing red hot. Vitcher said, trucks loaded with steel would pass by and you could feel the back of your neck burning standing 20 feet away. In an article called A Dangerous Work Site, the U.S. Department of Labor wrote, underground fires burned at temperatures of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. This was confirmed by Mayor Giuliani. There were fires of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit below the ground. The Journal of the American Society of Safety Engineers wrote, thermal measurements taken by helicopter each day showed underground temperatures ranging from 400 to more than 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Eight weeks later, and the fires still had not subsided. You see how this debris is still smoking? That's when the fire is going to still burn it. Eight weeks later, we still got fires burning. So, I mean, these things are burning. At one point, I think they were about 2,800 degrees. Eleven weeks later, and the fires kept burning. As recently as the end of November, it was still 1,100 degrees down underneath the rubble. As November turned into December, ice was noticed in the mornings above the ground, but the debris underneath was still smoldering. The weird thing was it was very cold when we were up there. I believe it was, it was in the middle of the winter but the ground wasn't frozen. The ground kind of like bubbled underneath your feet, which was kind of strange to me. It took until December 19, more than three months after the collapses, for the last underground fire to be extinguished. You must have had a much hotter heat source for you to get 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Your heat source must be something like a chemical reaction, an exothermic chemical reaction that reacts, in the case of thermite, reacts at 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit.